Hello, I'm Eric Landrum from the Psych Sessions Network and also a Season 3 co-host of Teaching Matters, along with co-host Dr. Rob McIntarfer from Lincoln Public Schools in Lincoln, Nebraska. We're pleased to bring you this collection of 10 episodes recorded from September 2021 through April 2022. Two episodes in Season 3 featured guests. In Episode 4, we speak with Casey Swanson from Plymouth High School in Canton, Michigan, and in episode 10, we speak with Ginger Wickline from Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia. As usual, a wide range of topics are discussed across these 10 episodes. Here is just a sample. Research methods, student mental health, hypothesis testing, fictions teachers tell themselves, self-care tips, assessment chat, rubrics, AP psychology, IB psychology, high school teachers making connections with college teachers, understanding graphs, accreditation, rather than doing more, purposely doing less, the subjectivity of grading, study skills advice, modality switching during the semester, adapting to natural disasters in one's life, using storytelling purposely as a teaching strategy, the professional demeanor at conferences, improv for teachers, why, oh, why extra credit, STPs, This Is How I Teach blog, hearing the diverse voices of teachers of psychology, and so much more. Please enjoy Season 3 of Teaching Matters from Psych Sessions. Welcome back. It's Season Infinity. I have no idea what season we're in, <laughs> uh, what season of the podcast, although we are coming up on a holiday season. Well, uh, yes. Uh, nice transition. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Happy Friday. Ha happy Friday. Happy Friday before Thanksgiving break. Absolutely. Uh, 2021. And that's actually kind of what I wanted to talk to you about. I'm not sure how much meat there is on this turkey bone, but I thought it might be worth <laughs> Thank you for the cackle. But um, I... I think educators, I suspect this is true for K-12, although I don't know it. Educators put a lot of pressure on themselves approaching a break like this, whether it's a one-week Thanksgiving break, a one-week spring break, or a three- to four-week Christmas-slash-holiday break, meaning I'm going to get caught up. I'm using air quotes for our listeners, as opposed to I'm going to get caught up in my sleep. I'm going to get caught up with my family. I'm going to get caught up with friends or I'm going to get caught up on my favorite Netflix series, which may be just as or more important than getting caught up on grading or other university or high school or K-12 tasks. I, so this, I wanted to see what your thoughts are about it and just chat about it a little bit. Yeah, I think that plays out in K-12 in a super similar way. My colleagues, as people who have listened to this before know, I only have four students, so I'm leaving myself out of this. It's easy for me to stay caught up with my four, with my four you've students. Got our, you've got an entire career's worth of teaching <laughs> in classrooms, though. Right. That's right. So it's very true that like college folks, K-12. All right, now, if you'll start again with your mouth in front of the microphone, that'd be really great. Sorry. Amateur. Amateur. Sorry. Uh oh, no. A guy needs his coffee. I get it. <laughs> K-12 teachers also count on weekends and breaks in order to get caught up. I heard tell recently of a teacher who took a day off from teaching a sub covered classes. So lost a vacation day just to get caught up on grading, which is just a damn shame. So we do, we do the same thing. We think we think ahead and maybe think single-mindedly, maybe dogmatically about, I'm going to get caught up this break instead of thinking about how to use a break to take a break. And, you know, I think, I think it's, oh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong in thinking that. I think the, where the issue comes in is that if a, if a teacher puts too much pressure on themselves, that I'm, you know, it's kind of like a student saying, I'm going to stay up all night and write that paper before it's due 8 a.m. the next morning. It's like a teacher saying, I'm going to get caught up on everything over the Thanksgiving break and I'm going to have everything graded before I go back Monday morning. It's so much pressure on yourself. And then if you make the, what I'm going to say, 
rookie mistake or novice mistake of telling your students, I'm going to be caught up on Monday morning. I stopped making that promise a long time ago. Yeah. It's tough because we want to model good work habits for students, but then there's a tension between what we mean by good work habits. Good work habits are healthy work habits, but also good work habits are keeping up. And we want to model for students that we're working hard because we want them to work hard. Oh, I, oh, th maybe this is the more important topic than what do we do over break, but it's the balance between holding students accountable for deadlines in a course while modeling holding oneself accountable as a faculty member for providing timely feedback. Because I, I've got a situation in my capstone class this semester where one piece of earlier assignment would be informative to a later assignment. And I definitely, and I told my students, I, I need you to have feedback on part A before you turn in part B. And I was so late on giving them feedback on part A that I actually bumped the deadline for part B three times. I didn't just have them part B do when it was originally done. And I think that's one way to handle that accountability. I just told them it's important and it's on me and I'm going to move it back. But I have the luxury and the privilege of tenure and I can say that. And if they beat me up on... um evaluations, which I know faculty members care about. I'm the department chair. I'm 30 years into my career. I don't worry about them as much. And even for my own faculty, they know I'm their department chair and they know that I won't beat them up over that because we care about our students, but we also care about our faculty. Agreed. That sounds like super good modeling. We would want students to make similar decisions if they were working in a group, say, and they needed to adjust something in order to make the product better and actually get everyone's contributions, which is what you're doing as a teacher. I think it gets another complication that does relate to breaks, like the one we're coming up to that I think teachers often experience, is uh, we want to emphasize to students, boy, take care of yourselves. You absolutely need to take a break and don't just knock yourself out trying to get caught up all over break. And I'm not going to knock myself trying to get caught up over break either. We're going to model healthy behaviors. But I don't know about you, in the back of my teacher mind, there's always one or two students who I'm thinking at the same time those words are coming out of my mouth, I'm thinking, but boy, you two need to get caught up. Well, boy, but you, you, you really need to use this break to get caught up because goodness, I'm worried about you. And it's sending those multiple or individualized messages is hard. Well, I, I am sending every student I get to talk to either in groups or individually. I hope you get a chance to rest and recharge. That's my typical phrase. Mm -hmm. And I hope you get a chance to do what you need to do, knowing that some of them do need to do some work or they're going to have to go to work or, you know, they may not be visiting family. So I, I try to be super careful. But at the same time, knowing that I plan to work my ass off because I am so far behind I'm grading for my two classes that I need to really use this time to not have committee meetings, not have department meetings, and really get caught up in my grade book because I owe it to my students. So I am yeah. not going to model resting and recharging over break. The irony is I will probably get burnt out uh, by Wednesday or Thursday and have to rest or recharge. Because if I truly work Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, like I think I need to five days in a row, I'm going to risk getting sick. Yeah. What do we know from, uh, since you, have, I have, you and I have both taught intro, I've never taught health psychology, have you? No. Oh, the course? Yeah. No. And, and some, some interesting textbook chapters have uh, a chapter devoted to it. Sometimes some of that stuff creeps into a motivation and emotion chapter. Yeah. It, that content gets into most books, sometimes in its own chapter, but sometimes distributed across other chapters. Yeah. So we may not have the content knowledge to talk about this, but that's never stopped us before. Oh, hell uh, no. no. Do we know anything from our content that we would advise students to use as they plan their work over break and we should advise ourselves to use as we plan over break? Well, I think we know from masked and spaced practice that spaced practice is better. So, you know, telling yourself, I'm going to work for six hours on Tuesday night is probably not a good strategy for retention. It'd probably be better 
to work for an hour every other day over break and come back and, you know, do different types of practice and have that practice be related to the end task. So we also know things like highlighting and even rudimentary flashcards aren't really good for learning. There actually are some flashcard techniques that are better, but they're way more complicated. In fact, I think Steve Chu has written about there, you know, if you have this five-sided flashcard where you have to kind of manufacture it yourself with glue or staples, where it's not just a topic on one side and a definition on the other side, but it's a topic, then a definition, then an application, then then, you know, writing your own definition in your own words, you know, there's like, I can't remember what the fifth one is. But. Of course, Steve Chu would have a five-dimensional flashcard space in his head somehow. Since well, I, of, I think, of, I'm convinced that's how, his, that's how his brain works. Of course, because that's how he starts to account for the nine-way interaction that explains uh, <laughs> the teaching and learning of high school and college students. Um, right. But, you know, and also, you know, just the things like, you know, whether it's a high school student or the typical, somewhat typical 18 to 25 year old college student, we know those brains are still developing. So mm -hmm. really truly getting enough sleep and a somewhat healthy diet really could be essential during a holiday break. Absolutely. And some of the advice, I like how you started with spaced practice, the advice mostly from cognitive psychology about how to use study time effectively. Maybe that could be usefully paired with a break. So over break, I really want you all to both study this class and rest and relax or rest and recharge. Hey, there's a way to do that. Study smarter. Don't spend time rereading the text five times because we know that isn't effective. Do this instead and it will save you time and it means you have more time to eat turkey. That's right. Uh, get your trip to trip to fan high and i think yeah. i think it's okay to mention that and i forget the publisher it might be sage it might be rutledge but regan gurung and john dunlowski have just finished their final work on a new study skills book cool they're going to be co-authoring and will be coming out and it's all going to be evidence informed and you know two people who have been passionate for decades about teaching and learning and all you know putting it all together, but in a way that's digestible for students. A lot of that advice is written for teachers on how to teach it to their students. They've written a book that is going to be aimed at students and giving the students advice on how to apply those skills in their own lives. Neat, neat. neat. And um, maybe a break is a time, maybe a less pressure packed time that students might be more willing to try some of those things. I, I find. Sometimes students are asking for study skills help when it's acute and there is something coming up. There's something looming and they actually, they may have no choice but to cram. Right. Um, yeah. If, if they've got, in, yeah. Yeah. When students are in, I'm sorry, Rob. When so students are in an academic crisis, that's probably the wrong time to experiment with new study strategies. Just because of the stress and the anxiety, it's, it would be something like over a summer. Yeah, where you're reading that, or the summer before college, or the summer before high school would be a yeah. great time to be thinking about study strategies as you're getting ready for new academic challenges. Agreed. And when, as we're coming up towards maybe a week off or something like that, if a intro psych professor has already covered some of those study strategies, maybe there'd be time to bake into your class. Hey, you know the study strategies we we talked about. You've got a week, make a quick sketch of a week and write out what you're going to do to rest and recharge and how many hours you're going to do that on each day. And then a study skill you want to try to implement each day. Make yourself a little schedule. That sounds humane. Yeah. And I think the way, at least at the college level, you get intro psych students to do that is that you offer a modicum of extra credit. That seems to be... Um, the palette that one uses in the uh, intro psych Skinner box uh, <laughs> to get a student to try something. And if it was palatable during a Thanksgiving week, say, hey, just do this little two hour unit sometime, you know, Tuesday, when, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of Thanksgiving week, and I'll give you 2% of a final grades worth mm -hmm. of uh, extra credit. And that might be the time, you know, 
during that week where you get student to think about, oh, oh, that's what interleaving means, or that's mm -hmm. what spaced practice means, mm -hmm. or that's what, a, a, oh, a quiet study environment doesn't mean with my earbuds on in front of a TV, with my laptop open with four animals at my feet with two roommates <laughs> while they've got their stereo going and one's making dinner, you know, blah, blah, blah. So. Yeah. If we turn this towards ourselves as teachers, is there any advice? So let's say we've got a pile of grading. We're we're we got a pile of grading we know is facing us over break. Do is there any advice from maybe motivation or cognition that we should apply to ourselves and pre-plan? Here's how I'm going to make my way through this mountain so that I can also rest and recharge over break. Well, I I I don't know how much of it is evidence based. I think some some of the, things are tricks and tips that apply to me that might not generalize well and may not have any evidence in efficacy. I know for me, it's really important that I start. I will delay and delay and delay. And once I start, then the ball is literally rolling. So it's much like students working on a paper. They will delay and delay and delay. And I will do the same thing with a batch of anything. Uh, I will put it off, put it off, put it, but once I start, it's generally fine. I, I, I'm on a roll. That's one thing. I can totally relate to that. Just overcoming that initial procrastination or reticence, or for me, it's I'm clinging to leisure time and I don't want to let go of a little bit of leisure time and just begin. But once you begin, that momentum does carry you through. And I, so I'll, I'll share one that I have right now. And, you know, none of my students are ever going to listen to this. So I'm okay saying this. I have a, they do, in my capstone, they, have, they do a podcast recording that's two to three minutes. And so I get to hear their voice in an 80 person class. You know, I'd love to have them do student debates where they get up and, you know, they do a pro-con debate and, you know, a 10-minute, you know, speech and then an eight-minute rebuttal would be awesome. But, you know, with 80 students, we're just not going to do that. Mm -hmm. but, but I honestly really enjoy hearing their voices, mm -hmm. especially in a pandemic semester with masks. However, the thought of, okay, Saturday morning, I'm going to start listening to my 80 podcast <laughs> recordings. 80 times three is 240, 240 divided by 60 is four hours solid without a uh -huh. break. And so I'm going, oh, four hours solid in the morning without a break, grading with my rubric. Oh, I think I need to mow the lawn. Right. I think I need to reorganize the garage on that Saturday morning. So even though I know it's going to be pleasurable listening to those, because I enjoy them, I've done it in the past. It's that, that's getting over that initial hump. Once I start, I'll be fine. Another yeah. tip for me is I have learned about myself to not grade when I'm in a bad mood. Yeah. If I'm in a bad mood, I know I'm giving students more negative feedback and lower grades than they deserve. Mm -hmm. So once I detected that and corrected for it, I just decided even if I have to return things later than I like, even if students complain about it in their post-semester valuations. It's just worth it to wait until I'm in a fair to good mood than to hurry and grade, to keep a promise, to get it over with. That's one of the reasons I stopped making promises. I think my tip is related to that. It's probably tangential to context-dependent memory. I was always super tempted to find a very comfortable nest to reward myself with a comfortable nest at a coffee house or on my couch or in a favorite chair, or if it's warm, do that great outside to reward myself for doing some grading that I didn't want to do by getting in a comfortable atmosphere. I eventually found I just need to be at my desk. I need to get to my desk. I would go to school even if it was on a weekend, if I really had a pile of papers to get through, go to school, sit at my desk, and that context helped me get down to business. Yeah. I think it helped me give better feedback and more fair grades too. There's, there was something about that context where the only thing I'm supposed to be doing at this desk is work stuff, and I'm getting down to work stuff. Well, I completely agree. I mean, your home's your home, and people who love you might come in and need your help, and you want to help them, or... You've got a project waiting for you in a different part of your home or your garage or outside or inside. 
and there's stuff to do there. There's, there's fun stuff to do there. And there's, there's more distractions at home for most people than there are in their office. So that, that this makes gets, good sense. Yeah. This gets compounded in K-12, I think, and probably a lot of higher ed as well, because the model used to be, I was at my desk with a stack of, stack of physical papers and I could actually just leave the stack of physical papers on my desk and have to go to my desk to grade the things. Now that our, our school system is Chromebooks and Google Classroom, a lot of classes are almost completely paperless. So now my desk comes with me wherever I take my laptop and it is much more tempting. I see K-12 teachers grading everything everywhere um, grading while waiting for a haircut appointment. I've saw, I saw a teacher doing that and that's admirable and maybe it works for them, but going paperless means you can't leave your grading anywhere if you carry your laptop with you. Yeah. And one more thing about grading, and then I want to come back to the point that I, I think you're taking us to, or, or I'm going to take us to, I suppose it's sometimes it's, Grading is, I don't want to say the worst part of the job, but it's the most onerous part of the job because, oh, I know the thing I want to say. I, I agree with that. So that part, but I still super rely on rubrics. It may be the greatest takeaway I ever got from my participation in AP psychology reading was the practice of rubrics. And so I use rubrics. We're using Canvas now rather than Blackboard at Boise State. And I, I give my students the, the rubrics. We go over them well before this, the assignment, and I am literally staring at them as I'm grading so that I can link to that rubric, and, and I am honest and fair to that rubric as much as I can be. But, but grading is that onerous thing that, you know, and I just, I, I guess, I, again, I have that privilege where I just go into my students and I say, no matter what anyone tells you that this is a, an objective process, it's not. I am sub, I'm a subjective human being. So if you want to come in and talk to me about that, you, you can, you're welcome to, and I'll show you, here's why I thought this, this way, here's how I connected it to the rubric. Here's why I don't think this is distinguished work. I think this is superior work, or I think this is average work. And here's why. That's super smart. And putting a plug in for different styles of rubrics and different teachers find different styles useful for different tasks. There's a blog. And I think there's a podcast too, but I just read the blog called Cult of Pedagogy. And the author of Cult of Pedagogy wrote an interesting blog post about something called a single point rubric that some people say is a rubric. Some people say it's actually a modified checklist and I don't care which it is, right. but it, it can be super useful. So if anybody hasn't looked that up, the single point rubric, there's a lower point of, there's a lower point of entry because you're not writing quite as much. You're not fleshing out a complete rubric, but it's a way to get either a rubric or a modified checklist that you can use on an assignment pretty quickly. Well, I will tell you this, not to launch into some big argument with, you know, the dozens of listeners that we have, but, <laughs> but when I grade pretty much anything these days, uh, I use three buckets. I mean, my grade, first off, Boise State has plus minus, all right, as a final grade. I don't use it. I, I don't see the world in 13 shades of gray. Uh, mm -hmm. Although I will use A, B, C, D, F as somewhat mandated. Mm -hmm. But when I, Rob, when I grade like major assignments, I use three buckets. Mm -hmm. I use proficient, I use competent, and I use novice. I am very confident that I can reliably place students' work with rubrics with high inter intra rater reliability. Mm -hmm in those three buckets over and over. Could I do it with five buckets? I'm not so sure, A, B, C, D, F. But with three buckets, I, I'm pretty sure that I can. So that's what I do. Boy, that makes a lot of sense. And let's let's write this topic down for a future entire podcast. There's an assessment grading author, who's Thomas Gusky, who writes a lot about grading practices. And he, what he says relates to what you said in the sense that if we're using a percentage grading system right now in our in our secondary schools, it's a percentage grading system that translates to a letter grade. He says what you're really arguing there, and this is an operational definition argument. Since you have 100 points on that scale, you're arguing that you can tell the difference between students who are at an 89 in their knowledge and skills and a student who, who's at a 91 in knowledge and skills, that you can actually differentiate between those two, two students, because sometimes that's going to be a difference between a letter grade. Right. And that's 
that's silly on the face of it. So he argues for that launches us into standards-based grading, which is another whole thing that we should talk about some other time. Before we leave grading in this topic, which is leading up towards a break, is it is it interesting that we went to grading instead of going to something like planning? So I rarely, I often hear teachers as they're coming up towards a break, talk about, boy, I need to get caught up on my grading. I'm not, I think I seldom hear teachers say, boy, I need to get caught up on planning or other teaching activities. Yeah. So yeah, Rob, you're, you're one, you're, you're looking ahead. Thanksgiving break, I wouldn't be thinking that because I'm in the middle of my semester. Sure. Over my Christmas break, my holiday break. Yes. That's when I'm not a, I, that's because by Christmas break, I've turned into my grades for my fall semester. And absolutely, yes, I'm planning for my spring semester. So for this That might break, just be I'm me because I'm only planning a week ahead in my AP research class. So that might just be me. Yeah. I, oh, I, oh, I say you're planning for the week right after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I guess I'll, I'll fess up because I've taught Capstone a, a few times in the format I'm teaching it. I don't actually, and I teach at one thirty to two forty-five Monday, Wednesday. I don't do my literal planning for that day's activities until that Monday morning. So that's the luxury I give myself. I, I don't worry, so to speak, about what am I exactly going to do until that morning, and then I block out that entire morning, and I have spent four hours preparing for seventy-five minutes. Yeah plenty of times because that has given me the freedom to not be spending any other time like over the weekend prepping for Monday morning. That That's another good tip, actually. Be unlike me and be prepped farther out ahead. No, I'm, I'm saying that kind of facetiously, but it is. The more and the more work we put in early on on the organization of our classes, the less work we have to do over things like Thanksgiving break. But Rob, but that might not work for most high school teachers. If you're teaching six out of seven hours, class hours of the day, or five out of seven, and you're not teaching the exact same topic, you might not be able to devote four hours of your morning to teach your fifth fifth hour period. Yeah, it is tough. And is this terminology shared between high school and college? High school and middle school and other teachers will talk about, I have a new prep this year, or I don't have a new prep Absolutely this year. Absolutely share. Okay. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So that, sure. that makes a world of difference. A new prep for uh, in K-12 system probably means that you're doing at least some, at least the teachers that I know, you're doing some on the fly planning. You're staying a week out, a week ahead. You're staying a month ahead of the kids in your planning. It's usually not all planned out in advance for the reason you mentioned. Yeah. If you're teaching a new prep in the fall, mm -hmm. you would be well advised to do as much as you could over the summer. Yeah. If you were teaching a new prep in the spring, you could do a little bit of it, but unless you're just a superstar, you're you're probably if it were me, I'm just going to be honest, I'd probably be about 30 minutes ahead of my students <laughs> yeah. the first time I taught the course. Yeah, sometimes sometimes that's that's where I'm at. Yeah. I also have to discipline, now I'm getting off topic, but the other thing that I have to discipline my teacher self to do is I may have had perfectly, I may have spent some time making some good plans. My past self spent some good time and some good thinking making those plans. For some reason, my present self thinks it's a good idea to change them right now and to go with something that I just thought of. And I don't know why I do that. Well, I think it's because you have experience. And, you know, if you walk into that classroom, whether it's four or 40 or 400, yeah, and you sense genuine excitement from your students about a topic that is somewhat or tangentially related, but you can, you can fit it and you see it in your head, even though they may not see it. Why, you know, why not divert the path and, yeah. and pivot into, you know, you know, turn into the tornado, turn into their <laughs> interest and leverage that. I mean, unless you just have to be totally linked to a departmental final exam where you're, where they, you know, they have to, you have to cover chapter 12. Yeah. If you don't, you're disadvantaging your students and their future into getting into the next prereq, the next post-requisite course. 
That that was my choice this morning. That's really well put. It was my plan this morning was to finish up quasi experimental designs, and I had a little pop quiz for him, where I diagrammed some famous psychology experiments because my four students have all taken psychology or are taking it, and they had to figure out which quasi experimental which true experiment or quasi experimental design matched the famous experiment, and then name the famous experiment if if they could remember it. So we did that, and it, it worked well for that purpose. One of them was the Milgram study, and then they started remembering what they thought they learned about the Milgram study and getting totally excited about it. So we spent, we ended up spending about 15 or 20 minutes actually talking about the Milgram study, and that was good because then they were able to identify, okay, what independent variables did Milgram actually study, and we got to do some actual research because they're rarely all mentioned in an intro textbook, so that was, that was good. But then that naturally segued, as it often does, into the Zimbardo prison simulation. And they got to talk about how that didn't match the true experiment between groups model and why. So it was all good, but I didn't get to correlation, which I was also supposed to cover today. So yeah. that's going to have to get bumped to next week. And did you get to talk about how Milgram and Zabardo went to the same school? And there's didn't I should? There's oh a man, class I, picture I, of them I, together. Right. A couple I'll have of to mention that apart. on Monday. I totally forgot. I'll have to mention that on Monday. That's a good one. Yeah, and you know. Milgram did so many variations of his yeah. study over over years and years. I mean, we all cite the one, but if you go and look at the book uh, that he wrote, was it four, five, six years later? You know, he does it with different genders, different ethnicities. I mean, it's pretty predictable the effect that he gets, with a couple of really interesting exceptions. The and I think I read. Boy, I hope I'm not constructing this memory that one of the variables he was testing was either proximity or actual physical touching where the fake teacher is grasping the hand of the fake le learner and putting it on top of a metal plate. I think that's one of the independent oh, really? variables that he actually, I think, but I might be constructing that. And I think there is one combination. There's one intersectionality of, uh, I'm not going to remember it, so I'm not going to try, of national origin and gender where they don't shock people two thirds. Huh. Interesting. Uh, you know, two thirds shock them to 450 volts. Wow. And I, 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 I don't want to even guess cause I don't want to offend. Sure. Two groups together, but it was really interesting, you know, almost universally two thirds will shock the entire 450 except for a couple of combinations which were really yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So those, and I've heard them called rabbit holes, but that doesn't really honor that they can be super useful. These, 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 the, and it's not really a tangent. Well, Sometimes we're, we just go down a track in a class that turns out to be super useful. But I wonder if, and I know, I know we're, we're drifting, which is, sure. which is, but I, <laughs> but I think, but maybe the point of the drift in the classroom is, um, your students also can, will hopefully notice but you are really listening to them. Yeah. And instead of you just sticking to your notes and you stayed in your lane and all right, class, I've got to get through correlation because you're going to have a test next Monday after Thanksgiving break. So mm -hmm. rather than being that person, mm -hmm. you were interested in what they were saying and you went down that rabbit hole and that that means that you're listening and that you care and you know what you'll get the correlation it'll still be there it didn't go anywhere and i think rob i actually think that has real value and and valuing our students i agree and i like the distinction that you're making if if i'm listening if i'm really present with my students and i'm listening to them and that takes us off in a different direction that's one thing but it often happened to me as a teacher, it still does, that I think of something and I take the class spontaneously off in a different direction. And those are two different actions. Those are two different teacher moves. And now I want somebody to observe me in a class and mark when those different teacher moves are taken. Because, because I, my hypothesis or my idea is if, if a change in direction instigated by a student, that might be something I want to happen the, in the class if I'm instigating a change of direction just based on something that I randomly thought of, maybe that's an impulse I should sometimes resist. I, 
I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about, it kind of depends on what's going on in your class. Maybe early in the semester as you're building rapport, yeah. your, your self-motivated digressions could be really meaningful. You're building rapport. They're getting to know you. They're getting to know your sense of humor. You're telling, you're telling your classic stories, the ones that we right. all have. You're telling that story about that time as a new father, you did this thing with your daughter and it's, a yeah. first, I don't even know it. I'm just making this up. Sure. I'm assuming yeah. you've got a, a, a list of these or you the thing that you did as a new teacher or, you know, the time I walked into my classroom and my son was really young and I'm writing on a chalkboard. And all of a sudden I pull out one of his baby socks out of my shirt because <laughs> I had been doing laundry, you know, or, or the time I split my pants right before class. <laughs> I'm telling my students this, the awkward thing before class, I didn't have time to go home. So in my office with my door shut, I drop my pants and staple the hole back together <laughs> and walk into class. And my students are wondering, why am I walking so gingerly? And I have to tell them I'm. Trying to avoid the <laughs> in my crotch. I mean, so, you know, I think you diverting those stories can have real purpose and connecting and bonding. And, you know, it's the whole storytelling bit, right? There we go. Right. Um, right. So I, I guess, not that you asked my advice, trust your gut. I mean, whether it's a student motivated diversion or a self motivated diversion. Yeah, they may not be inherently superior or inferior, but I think that distinction might be interesting to play with. Yeah, and actually, especially if we're observing each other's classes or something like that, that could be something that would be easy to mark and then talk about. And then as a teacher, I think I'd like to know from an outside observer how many student motivated digressions or diversions and what they were versus self-motivated digressions or diversions. Yeah, I think the only time I'm just trying to think about this on the fly, the only time it could get to be a, a disadvantage would be if they happen too often mm -hmm. or if they happen so often that students know there's a test coming up, yep. they know it's over chapters four and five and the test is Friday and on Thursday's class, you're going, okay, well, I haven't been able to get to this information. So now I'm going to cover all the information mm -hmm. that's on tomorrow's mm -hmm. test. And yep. so if they see that those nice leisurely diversions Monday, through Wednesday, although funny and humorous and endearing, now have made you or me accelerate. And I, I've seen this and had it reported to me by other faculty members. Faculty members had a nice leisurely semester until the last three weeks, and they yep. weren't willing to adapt their testing strategy. Right. So, they, so the faculty member crammed lectures yeah. and wouldn't adjust tests because they already had them made up because they were multiple yeah. choice. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming up to a related point in my AP research class because students are, they've got research questions, they've got a draft of the literature review, they've got a literature gap. We're covering different research or discussing different research methods now. The idea is I'm going to hit a point where students get to do a research proposal form where they're trying to match their research question with, with a research method. And my goal is that we've had thorough time to discuss all the research methods so they can make an informed choice and they can justify that choice. If I keep pushing that too far, that means their research proposal form doesn't get done, which means we start pushing IRB approval, which means we start pushing data collection and we get to a crunch at the end of the year. And anybody who's done a master's project or a dissertation knows that that can get real tough real fast. If you keep pushing those early deadlines, it doesn't do you any favors later on. So I'm, there's a tension for me between how quickly I cover research methods so that students can make an informed choice. But also I think, you know, the beauty of what you're doing is that you're giving them the real life experience of researchers. Oftentimes researchers don't know what the, what the best or better choice would have been until after they've done a few studies. Yeah. I mean, and I, I'm trying to I encourage them that they need to be tolerant of ambiguity right now, because whatever plan they come up with right now is going to change. And right. that's, that's going to be hard for these little type A seniors. Yeah. And, you know, the ones that are truly finding a passion somewhere in the middle of next semester are going to come to you and go, 
I want to do a second study. Absolutely. <laughs> They're going to, yeah. and those are the ones that are going to go, let's talk about you going to college being a psych major. Right. Because those, the ones that are still interested and know that they need to do a second study are really good candidates for majoring in psychology. Absolutely. Wouldn't it be cool to have data on... That's the um, predictor right there. Yeah, it is. And the graduate students doing a master's project or a dissertation, how, what percentage of them approach their advisor at some point and say, oh, I think we got to collect this in addition to what we're collecting. And the advisor's role is always to hey, settle down. This isn't the only thing you're going to do in your career. That's a second article, or that's your book, or that's a third article, or that's a fourth article. It's a weird position to be in to rein researchers, like pull them back. I think it happens all the time. You have to, because otherwise you never get anything done. There's a, yeah. Oh, I don't know who the cartoonist is. It might be Matt Gronig from The Simpsons. It might mm. be, uh, oh, who's the guy who does Then a Miracle Occurs? Oh. Famous, uh, damn it. Yeah, far side. No, right? no, oh, no. I, I'll think of him. Anyway, okay. you know, you're uncertain about your dissertation. What do you do? Read another journal article. Yeah. Repeat. You know, read another <laughs> yeah. journal article. Repeat. Um, yeah. I thought you're, here's where I thought you were going to geek out. You know, you get people earning their, whatever their terminal degree is, may, maybe master's or doctorate. And then if you did the study, what was the moment Pope? I guess pre haste, not post haste. What was mm. the mo what was the predictive moment? Mm. Right? Was it a high school teacher allowing you to do a project? Was it that science fair? Was it uh, mom and dad's divorce and you wondered out loud? I wonder mm. why this happens. So you became a marriage and family therapist. I mean, is there a pivot moment, or does it happen over time? I and mean, I thought that's where you were going. That's a cool research topic, and that's might be related to you've done such good work with predictive skills or skills that are useful for psychology majors and others post-graduation that that topic is kind of related when did you know what was the instigating factor or the inflection point that got you thinking seriously about a certain career yeah and i think most people the answer is they don't know they can't yeah. point it um Plus, you know, Rob, but here's the dirty little secret, and I may have to like muffle this part of the recording. <laughs> I've written a lot about skills, but the actual skills in the laboratory or the real world, measuring them and then using those as predictors of other things. I've done a tiny bit of the actual hands-on work, but actually not as much as you might think. Hmm. So just to just to fess that up, I should, I should uh, confess. To while we're confessing, I feel like I should know more. That what you, you just reminded me of an earlier topic, but I think it's related to this topic. If anybody's looking for research ideas, I don't think I've ever read anything empirical about teacher grading behaviors that have benefits as far as efficiency or accuracy of grading. That is such a ubiquitous thing that we do as teachers. You'd think someone would have done some empirical work, and I think it could be done, about contextual factors, behaviors that we do, rubrics. I mean, I know there's some there's there's research on whether you use a rubric or not and validity and reliability. So that's there. But other other stuff that teachers would find useful. How many should you grade at a time? Um, oh, that's, should you that's should you useful. mix up should you mix up? multiple choice or more objective forms and more subjective forms, or should you do it all at the end? There's a little bit of, about expectation effects and implicit bias I know about. Should you know the student's identity as you're grading okay. their work, or should you not know the student's identity as you're grading their work? But, I, but with such a common teaching activity, maybe I just need to look harder. I think there should be more work done on advice for us teachers when we're facing a pile of papers. What are some things, some techniques we should use? Well, and Rob, so what your rec so a couple things. One time I was getting ready to give a talk somewhere and I wanted to open with a, a general stat about how many how many multiple choice tests are given in the US in a year. I just wanted to, you know, you know, it's kind of like how many psych majors are there or how many you know, how many applications to graduate school are there? I, I, I just wanted a ballpark and I didn't have to have an exact number. 
and I, I, I must have looked for a week on and off before, before giving this talk and I couldn't find it. And I, I think there's a lot of things out there like you, what you just said, where either the data aren't available or they're not readily available. Yeah. So I think the answer to your question is, as you have kind of pointed out many times talking together, we'd almost have to do the study. Yeah. You'd almost have to find teachers and boy, you'd have to fu this would have to be funded because you're going to have to pay teachers to grade the same stuff, but in different conditions. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, mast versus space, a combination of all multiple choice versus multiple choice and true, false, yeah. and fill in the blank. And, you know, does the, does the compendium of types and flavors of items differ from all vanilla versus Neapolitan? Um, <laughs> is it going to matter the, the composition, the student, you know, and we'd have to generate, you know, fake student performance profiles yeah. and, you know, um, some sort of Monte Carlo study where, you know, yeah. it's all controlled and randomized. Somebody like the college board would be in a position to do something like this at the AP readings because there are in-person readings and there are at-home readings. And you could vary some variables and some conditions purposely and do some kind of A-B testing as long as you disclose that and get everybody's permission. They could do some stuff like that. Well, I, I don't mean to be uh, Mr. Cynical, but <laughs> it could very well be that ETS or the College Board ha have already done some of that. Could be. And that has motivated the design of what they do, and yeah. they already know what works and what doesn't. And I would like to think that they are doing the thing that works best for students. I hope so. But they probably I, I, are publishing what doesn't work or what yeah, they tried. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Because that's corporate stuff that they're going to protect. Right. Because they, yeah, they don't want to show in 2005, 2006, <laughs> some of the scores that were reported in some subsets. By the way, we'll never do that ever again. <laughs> we know that is uh, negatively affected uh, student scores that one year and that one condition. Yep. A bunch of that would be, would be proprietary too, but yeah. I think you're right that that would be a limitation on that research because you'd need a lot of papers and you'd need a lot of permissions to change things and you'd need a lot of participants who are willing to do some pretty arduous work. That'd be hard. Yeah, but, th but that's why you do fake profiles. You, you yeah. generate it and you have, you have faculty and you got to pay them to, to do it. And they, you know, they know, they know they're doing real grading, but it's not going to affect real students grades. If that makes right. sense. Right. Yeah. yeah, we did, you know, we could rename uh, this podcast, We Design Studies. If <laughs> only someone would come along and pick them up and do them. Rename it, grad students, if you need topic ideas, listen here. Yeah, I'm not so sure what that logo would look like, but it'd be awfully <laughs> wordy. It would be, yeah. Nope, I like our current name. And if, if we can't call it, oh, Rob and but Eric, I like our current name. Oh, Rob. But Eric, yeah, but Eric still fits, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, Rob fits darn well too. I, I should go back and see if I can pull that Laura Petri uh, soundtrack. <laughs> oh, Rob! <laughs> I can't mimic it, but I, I can hear, I can hear Mary Tyler Moore saying it in my head. We could make it into a button that we could play at will. Uh, just hitting a button on the keyboard and have that sound clip. Play. Oh, I like that. Or I thought, and I, I don't know how to say it properly, either a GIF or a GIF. Yes. We could make it into a visual effect with a sound effect. Right. I like it. Well, Rob, I think, I don't think we're going to get to storytelling so much. We'll have to maybe save that for next time. Yeah, let's, let's do, definitely do, because I think that'll be a great conversation. And I liked your article. Well... I had some help with that. So yeah, we're talking yep. to, are we talking to Casey next time? I think so. For listeners, you don't have to listen to us all of the next time. You'll have the wonderful Casey Swanson with us on December 3rd. Hey, and who, who was the gentleman that you mentioned earlier in this podcast with the grading stuff? Thomas Gusky. 
and the last name is G-U-S-K-E-Y, University of Kentucky. His dissertation advisor was Benjamin Bloom. If anybody's interested Holy in Bloom crap. research, yeah. So Gusky is the real deal, and I really like his writing. Is, so if anybody's interested in grading scholarship, I think Gusky's the, one of the people to, to read. Is he still active? Yes. Yeah. Do you know him? Yeah, met him through. So if anybody's a member of AERA, American Educational Research Association, Thomas Gusky is active in that organization. There's a special interest group that's part of AERA that he was, he's past president of now called the Classroom Assessment Special Interest Group. I wonder if in 2022, he would talk to us. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so maybe something to think about in, in the new year. Sounds fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I always tend to find more work for you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. It's, it's, I still have some homework. I'm supposed to find funding sources for summer high school workshops, and I haven't found that yet, but it's but, still- but Not for us though, right? No, oh, not okay, for us. Okay, good. Yeah. We're, we're giving, like we give other people research agendas, we'll also give other people workshop ideas. Okay, but I, I didn't give you that one. Well, you, I, it was sort of a semi-challenge to, because we were talking about summer NSF-funded research projects, and you said, well, I, I don't know that those exist anymore. Does anyone fund those? And I said, I don't know. Oh, oh, but you're going to look for them. You don't have to yeah. find the funding. No. Oh, I'm okay. just going to see it. I'm just going to see if anybody does that anymore. Okay, because Rob, I don't need to be giving you more work. I'm pretty <laughs> sure you have enough work as it is. Right back at you. Yeah, but you're not... I don't hear you giving me tasks. That's the difference. <laughs> You're nicer than I am. Although every listener to this podcast knows that. So let's be well, clear. And every listener to this podcast should know that all I have to do is talk. Dr. Landrum does the other work of taking the recordings later on and writing, doing intros and then writing summaries and getting this out there in the world. I, when I'm done talking, I'm done talking. All right, Dr. McIntyre, for the fun part of this is I get to edit out the last 45 seconds of this <laughs> recording. So go ahead. Unfair. Stop unfair. All you want. Unfair. Oh, life is unfair. Oh, but Eric. Oh, Rob. <laughs> oh, Rob. Oh, Rob. All right. Thank you. This was, this was great. Thank you, buddy. And seriously, happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. You too. Uh, rest and recharge. Yeah, I've heard that line somewhere. What? Whatever. <laughs> Whatevs. <laughs> All right.